Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. <laughs> wow, I'm loud. Tom. <laughs> I'm Tommy Vitor. I think. You are. I think you're still Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Senator Elizabeth Warren stopped by Crooked HQ to chat with Tommy. Uh, but before that interview, we thought that since we covered a lot of news in our uh, D.C. and Boston live pods, uh, we dig into the mailbag today to answer some of your questions on the midterms, messaging, favorite D.C. scandals, and more. We have a great episode premised on the idea that, we're that we didn't want to prep on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. I just want to reflect on the fact that Ooh. Massachusetts has gotten a lot of good coverage on this show lately. We had Senator Elizabeth Warren. We had Mayor Michelle Wu. Mm -hmm. We had Senator Ed we Markey. Had Mackey, yeah. Ed Mackey. Yeah. Yeah, we had quite a few Massachusetts politicians. You bet we did. Where are you at, Si uh, <laughs> I mean, we can try to book Schumer. I think we probably will soon. Let's get him on. Maybe let's, let's go. To do, a, are we doing booking now at just, the beginning of the show? Let's get a, go to a gas station on a Sunday and see see if we get any hits. <laughs> I thought we were talking about testicle tanning today, or is that just a Tucker Carlson? You know what? If we were doing a normal pod today, we would have, and no one asked about it in the questions. It, it was an mm -hmm. opportunity for you people. So it's a mailbag fill. All right, let's answer some questions, guys. Uh, first one: What does an optimistic rest of the year look like politically? Best case scenario for what gets done by the midterms. Uh, Have at it, Favreau. You want me to do it? Yeah, okay. what do you got? You, you do that one. Here we go. Mine is to throw my phone into a lake <laughs> and hide from the news. Here's on my list. I got a, I got a list of things that, got a that, list that go well. For a laundry the, list. This is, the, this is to give us, again, we don't do predictions here. Nope. This is the, all this goes well. I'm not going to say that we're going to win, but this is to give us our best chance here. Um, one, Mansion and Cinema agree to a bill... Mm -hmm. We won't we won't name the bill. It's just a bill uh, that raises taxes on the rich, cuts the deficit, lowers the cost of health care premiums and prescription drugs and invests in climate, though any bill will also probably increase fossil fuel production in the short term because otherwise Manchin won't agree to it. So there's some kind of bill like that that gets passed. Then Biden forgives uh, ten thousand dollars in student debt. It's going to be ten. It probably won't be 50 because he promised 10 in the campaign he didn't promise 50 that's the deal uh and takes a number of additional executive actions on things like minimum wage there's a bunch of other things he can do uh inflation settles down i probably should have put that first because that's probably going to have the biggest impact on what happens in the midterms settle down inflation settle down inflation hey so uh, there was you know there was some talk room. that the last report last week was probably the, the high point of inflation that was there was some hope about that, so we'll see. Um, there are no significant new variants that evade immunity. I think this could list, be new variants. I love I love this list. I think we go better is every time you did one, you dropped a kind of uh, a comic fake vase on your head. <laughs> you know what I mean? See, I was gonna say like a, a like a, a you, magic wand. I yeah. mean, you interrupted me. We could have had a great video of me just saying all those things, and then after the midterms, then you could yeah. drop the vase <laughs> on my head enough. one by one. A piano or an anvil. Um, so anyway, no no new variants that evade immunity. Uh, Republicans nominate some real Trumpy candidates in the Senate and the governor's primaries. Um, Trump can't keep himself out of the headlines. That would be helpful. And then Democrats really drive the choice between the Rick Scott agenda of raising taxes and cutting your health care and the Democratic agenda. So that's that's what I have on my list. The aristocrats. That was a good <laughs> list, John. It was a really Did I John. Miss hey, John. It was a really nice list. Thank I, you. I, I had some similar stuff in there. I talked to Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, about mm -hmm, yeah. um, watch your feet, John. Names are dropping. Here it comes. <laughs> oh, <Jesus> comes. <laughs> about inflation and the arguments we hear from her and from Democrats that seem to explain inflation, but not necessarily win a political argument about it. She had some interesting yeah. things to say there. Yeah, it's she has, I should say by the way, uh, she has a big op-ed in the New York Times today about what Democrats can do to avoid uh, midterm losses. Timed, I'm guessing, right to your interview yes. with her. I was gonna say, she was like, I got the Vitor out. interview, and now I'm going to do the rollout of yeah. the op-ed. You heard it here second. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we that's what we do here at Pod Save America. <laughs> that's our bed second. and brother. You, hey, you heard it here second. <laughs> that's a <laughs> that's bad. a great tagline. Put, let's put that on something. <laughs> About <laughs> America, you heard it anyway. Here a second. Uh, I said long-term tax credits for renewable energy. I love that. I would like some more progressive taxation. I, again, yeah, don't at me. I know that Cinema Mansion be paying on all this. Yeah, I love um, all these things. Uh, but, 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 but. I want as many liberal judges as humanly possible, and I want them to be as young as humanly possible. If we can get a teenage judge. What was Dan's? <laughs> what was Dan's? Dan's joke? There? Harvard 10K. Yeah, no, right. The, Harvard the, Law the, 10K. Yeah, right. The best. The best Supreme Court justice is the the most recent winner of the Harvard Law 10K. <laughs> Fastest time in the Harvard 10K. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, some executive action, the climate guns, whatever we got. I'd love to see some uh, January 6th committee results. Good. Yeah. yeah. I forgot some, about that. Some one. action yeah, there. That's good too. 
Maybe, um, maybe Elon puts Trump back on Twitter. Everybody gets reminded oh, of what a piece of shit he is. Here's a world of thing also. Maybe, mm. uh, you know, yeah, Putin can sort of come. Speaking of people settling down. <laughs> what, what if Elon buys Twitter and then he and Zuckerberg swap and they Freaky Friday it? We just had to cut something that was almost going to get us sued. Yeah, love uh, anything us else? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we are. Anyway, that's optimism. I just disavow John in case the, the uncut tapes get out. And yeah. I'm, I don't know anything. Uh, but anyway, that's the optimistic scenario, and that's why everyone should be uh, working hard. Midterm madness. VoteSaveAmerica dot com slash midterms. Because uh, if everyone gets to work, then all that can you know that possibly come true. The things you li- if the things you listed happened, that would be an extraordinary first two years of any administration in history. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to get right. A lot of stuff to go right there. Yeah, a lot of stuff to go right. All right. Um, Phoenix asks, you guys spend a lot of time laying out a groundwork. The city. For- yeah, the whole city. Yeah, they all get together. Cool. Uh, Go Suns. And this was the resolution that they came up with. You guys spend a lot of time laying out a groundwork for what Democrats can, should do, but it too often does not line up with what Democrats actually do, even when they seem like no-brainer obvious choices. Why do you think this is, and how much does it drive you crazy? And then in parentheses, uh, our, our producer said, lots of questions about why Democrats are so bad with messaging. It's because uh, they updated the Apple podcast app. And these members missed a lot of episodes. And yeah, a couple episodes in April, I didn't get. I think it's because um, we have super thin majorities, President Biden does, and it's really hard to get people to agree to stuff, especially when they're acting in bad faith, like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. I think if you separate the, the messaging issue from the policy issue, yeah. I think the policy issue is actually easier to explain than the messaging issue. The policy issue is a world in which you have the consensus of 99% of Democrats and you have zero Democrats currently looks the same in terms of policy outcomes out of Congress because we are short two fucking votes in the Senate because of uh, Cal Cunningham's uh, lack of restraint and Sarah Gideon's... It's apparently uh, never been to Maine. Never been to Maine. <laughs> She's like, it's so great to be here. You know, is it Bangor? How do you say it here? She's like, I thought... It, it's a Bangor. It's I not think the it's one next to Vermont. Never, seen, never said it out loud before. Bangor. <laughs> um, Sarah Gideon, Bangor. <laughs> the point is... That is all very frustrating, and we've all been frustrated by two years, and I think there's a lot of people who, rather than uh, be adults <laughs> about the reality that this requires nuance to understand, just simply blame Democrats online and social media, because I think it's more fun and uh, 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 easier to vent that way. Uh, the messaging question is harder, but one reason is uh, everybody thinks of themselves as a messaging genius, and everybody sees things a little bit differently. you got to put it on a bumper sticker. Mm-hmm. It's got to be short enough for a bumper sticker. You hear that a lot from uh, donors. At, uh, when you go to political events, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> especially in LA, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, two things you hear is you got to be able to put a Burma sticker in. Why isn't there a purple party? I belong. Well, I'm a I'm a rich cosmopolitan Angelino. Go, I'd like a purple party. Those are those are uh, fundraising events in Manhattan, mm-hmm. and you get some of that in San Francisco LA too. too. Yeah. yeah, LA. You get. Mm-hmm. I have a creative friend who can do uh, who writes for television. Maybe they can help with politics. <laughs> it's <laughs> about the story you tell. <laughs> this is scathing. <laughs> Jesus. Here's the thing. On the messaging front, I will say, having worked in politics and government, it is always uh, easier to give advice from the cheap seats, which is what we're sitting in right now. Mm -hmm. Um, It also, like, you know, what seems easy from the outside isn't necessarily easy inside. Like, maybe Joe Manchin does something and you're in the White House and you want to tear him a new asshole, but you know that you need his vote for, say, confirming Katanji Brown-Jackson to the Supreme Court, and which they got, right? So, like, there's a lot of compromises that you have to make. Um, so you can't necessarily just yell and scream like we get to do. I also think that messaging is hard because even if you have the messaging right, it has to still break through. And Democrats do not have a media apparatus to get their message out like Republicans do. And events yeah. in the world. You know, Ukraine is going to dominate the news for the last seven weeks no matter what. I do think that's actually a really big part of the problem, which is... You know, we yell at the people who will who will listen to us. It's easier. You don't like. It's it's more fun to yell at somebody who responds. Democrats yelling at each other. They get in each other's. Uh, Democrats yell at each other. They respond to each other. They engage each other. They debate each other. When meanwhile, you know, we are dealing with a <laughs> a media environment which there's really kind of like the stories are Democrats on defensive, Democrats out of touch, Democrats evil. Democrats divided. If it doesn't fit into one of those buckets, you're not gonna. It doesn't have. It doesn't float. It doesn't stay above the above the water. I'll also say, Dan always makes this point. We all have agency here, too. We are all messengers now because we all have uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram accounts that we can use to post to. And, you know, I, I think it is everyone has every right and, and should push Democrats, push Democratic leaders 
um, to, to pass legislation that, that they want, to push for policies that they believe in. But I would just think to yourself as we head into the midterms, if you look at all your feeds and look at all your posts, like what's the balance between criticizing Democrats for not doing enough and pointing out what Republicans are doing and the choice in the election? Like how many of you went on Twitter today and criticized Joe Biden but didn't talk about what he did to bring back the Mexican pizza? Right. Did he do that? Under Trump. Under under Joe Biden's predecessor, mm -hmm. the, the Mexican pizza was lost. Well, Joe under Joe Biden's administration, the Mexican pizza is back. This is a Taco Bell item. Mm -hmm. You bet it is. Is it good? Is it good? Yeah, tell me. Yeah, tell me. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's a pretty good item. <laughs> All right. What I, saying? Yeah. And I well, I would just say, and I'm not even saying like, oh, you got to give Joe Biden more credit for mm -hmm. shit. I'm saying like. We're, we're heading into an election where we want to frame it as a choice between the Democratic vision for the country and the Republican vision for the country. The Republicans are doing a lot of bad shit. We should spend some time talking about that. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. Again, that's not to give up your criticism of Democrats. Do that, too. Yeah, please. Just think about the balance. Think about the balance in your daily, in your, uh, your output. Um, and your right. input. And your input. Uh, Griffin asks, what's your favorite D.C. political scandal and why? The DJ? <laughs> yeah, you're, is that my you're friend Dan? Friend. Uh, uh, I think I think Tom, we're all probably thinking of the same scandal. You want to say it on three? Yeah. One, two, three. Teapot, teapot dome. dome. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking knew it. I knew he was gonna say teapot dome. I was about to say coke orgies. <laughs> coke orgies is my favorite. I've, I knew it. There's two options years. for what that was gonna be. It was either gonna be teapot dome or X Y Z affair. What's the X Y Z affair? I don't know. It involves France. Okay. Is that an old timey one? You bet it is. Uh, Tommy, I know you did some research on this, so why don't you dig into some of your favorite scams? I mean, Teapot Dome, 1920s oil companies bribe Warren G. Harding, Secretary mm -hmm. of the Interior, to get access to oil reserves that had been uh, cordoned off for the Navy, I believe. Stacks of cash in bags. There was a murder suicide. Was Harding a murder was kind suicide? of suicide. Oh yeah, Harding was kind of a creep uh, in his personal life. On top of that, good stuff. Wow. I don't know much about the teapot. I Google it today. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love mm -hmm. it. You got any others? Uh, no, that mine was also the teapot dome scandal <laughs> of the Harding administration. Uh, I'll just add, I'll add two. One is more of a, it's a political scandal, not as much of a DC scandal, but uh, I was surprised to learn that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, before he was president, recruited sailors to go have gay sex to prove that there were gay people in Newport, Rhode Island. Newport Dome scandal? Uh, no, I believe the scandal was by some referred to as the ladies of Newport. Uh, hmm. Anyway. Wow. You want my Iran-Contra notes? Yeah. Uh, Everything you researched, yeah. I want. Come you're on, you're this on is, contra notes? You didn't do this for nothing. Well, this is your opportunity. The one I thought we would chat about that I thought you guys were there for and we all watched happen was the Jack Abramoff scandal. That's what, mm. That was my, yes, because the emails were so good. Yeah, it's a good one because it's like, it's Frothy good, scandal it's in 2006. Good old-fashioned <laughs> bribery. <laughs> Frothy. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, I think Abramoff, that scandal, J Jack Abramoff was a lobbyist and a lawyer who was deeply connected in the Republican establishment. And I, I think... When what he did came out, it showed how morally bankrupt the biggest right wing leaders are. Right, it was Tom Delay, Grover Norquist, Ralph Reed, Newt Gingrich, and Jack Abramoff was an absolute scumbag. He was getting money from the apartheid South African government. He was lobbying on behalf of the Pakistani military after they tested a wow. nuclear weapon and it was disclosed. Yeah, and he just robbed his clients blind by padding his time schedule. And you put it in emails, be like, add 66 hours to my billing when I were, did two hours. And then there was like moments where in the emails, he was like, he would just write in all caps, I want their money, exclamation point, which didn't look great. They had dollar signs, dollar signs. And he was a producer on a Dolph Lundgren movie. Oh, now, interesting. None of these scandals are good. I think this, these, this one's interesting. Iran Contra is interesting just because of what it revealed about the broader system and how yeah. much money was distorting politics. You, you talking about Jack Abramoff and all the shit he did reminded me of uh, Paul Manafort, uh, Trump, Trump's first buddies. campaign manager, who got in plenty of trouble and then just recently, like, uh, Playbook interviewed him, like, what's Paul Manafort up to now and what does he think about how Joe Biden's doing? That really made me mad. <laughs> it's like, what? Why are we going to Paul Manafort for a quote now? He had great ties, Paul Manafort. I think he's I back in Congress. And he's, he's got his own chief. fucking consulting firm now. This is That's D.C. Jack for Jack Abramoff might be back. Uh, remember when Dick Cheney shot his friend in the face? And then the friend apologized. <laughs> that's power. That was a weird one. <laughs> that was a weird one. Iran-Contra is also a telling one because you have the Reagan administration selling arms to Iran despite an arms embargo. And then you, the proceeds are supposed to go to the Contras despite a provision 
passed by Congress specifically not allowing that. It seems clear that Reagan was in on it. George H.W. Bush was in on it. And then George H.W. Bush just pardons everyone. No one ever really talks about I it mean, again. Ra- There's Reagan no political was, fallout. Reagan was Feinsteining pretty hard by then, too. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe the, we, um, um, we've been talking about scandals. and like I got hung up on favorite D.C. political scandal, and I went to the Trump years and started thinking, like, what was the dumbest but sort of fun scandal mm-hmm. from the Trump years since there were so many serious ones? And I, I just thought about – all I could think of it was Trump – Changing the weather map with the Sharpie that was good. because he said that the hurricane was going to hit Alabama. That wasn't the case. The weather service had to correct him. And so he's like, oh, I'll correct the weather service. And then he just drew the line around yeah. Alabama. You know, it was a little one that we never got to the bottom of. It was when Sandy Berger, who was a national security official in the mm-hmm. Clinton administration, was caught stuffing classified documents into his socks. And he had apparently done it several times before, potentially. And we actually never found out why he was doing it or if there's anything he's destroyed that we didn't have copies of. We literally never yeah. got a full, real explanation. Maybe he just wanted to work from home. Maybe the elastic <laughs> yeah. on his socks kind of was It was the first. Apart. It was the first up. foray into the remote work. And, <laughs> and I, it's like, we'll I, don't wanna, I don't want to stay in the office and have to look at the classified yeah. documents here. I want to go it's home. Work-life I, balance. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy Berger's doing a hybrid thing. <laughs> he wanted to work. Yes. Understood. That's, a, that's plausible. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, here's here's a here's a question. Would you rather work in the Trump cabinet or marry into the Trump family? <clears throat> hmm. How how? I mean, how how? That's all how that far you, removed. That's all they gave us. Who you am you I can marrying? Take it wherever you want from there. Ivanka, Don, or Eric? Mm. Tiffany. Tiffany. Right. I always forget. Literally. Oh, I yes. Forget I mean, her. so does so does her family. I feel like um. I feel like this is a harder question for me than for you. Because, like, what am I doing here? Uh, where, where do I go? There's <laughs> nowhere to go. No, I can't Trump be co- family. There could be, like, cousins. Cousins? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I could marry Mary Trump. <laughs> it could be, like, a kind of, you know, what's that called? May, December, you know? I, I can know be what like, that's called. I don't know what you're referring cause to. Because she's, she's an older gal. What's a May, you December? Know? May, December relationship, you know? I'll be like her, uh, her, her, like, uh, what do you call it? Like a trophy husband. I'll be Mary Trump's trophy <laughs> husband. Oh, oh, is that how you think it would go? <laughs> 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 That's awesome. <laughs> and then we'll take on Trump together I and never have sex, not once, in the whole history of the thing. I just think I'd like work. Zero in, times. Work in the Trump cabinet. Two bedrooms. Do whatever I want mm-hmm. and then get fired. Write an anonymous I, op-ed and I, get a book yeah, deal. Right, then, yeah, a exactly. lot of people thought and they I'll could be do like that. A, a lot of people thought era. they could do that. Next thing I know, their husband's not getting endorsed in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> this one was paired with a who would you want to be stuck on an island with, and I accidentally answered that one. And I thought Mark, Mark Meadows, because you could very easily trick him into giving you his water and food provisions. <laughs> oh, I thought because you okay. wanted like a text buddy. Or no, or Wilbur Ross, because he would just be napping and wouldn't talk. Um, this, this question is from Not Jeff. That's why it was the Twitter name. The top three leadership positions of the House Dems have all been the same people since January 2007, and they're all 80-plus years old. Aren't Dems encouraging the notion that they're out of touch and handicapping their own chances? Isn't the lack of turnover hurting the party in the long run? Hard disagree. I hope Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer are in those jobs 10 years from now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a huge Don't change your, don't change horses midstream. Tell me what do you think. Is this from not Jeff Moulton? Hey. <laughs> hey. From, uh, uh, yeah, clear, hey, obviously it matters. I mean, think about, uh, we just did a show in Boston where we had the mayor, Michelle Wu, who I believe is 37, and Senator Ed Markey, who is the junior senator that from Massachusetts. In reverse. And it was the, their, the experience they bring to bear, but their communication style, leadership style. I mean, like they both were super interesting, compelling from different ways. And I, I think, I, yes, there, there's some younger members of Congress like Brian Schatz or Chris Murphy or others who just communicate in a different way, have different priorities, have different style. And I think like it matters. Having an older senator or an older speaker of the House, like that in and of itself is not an indictment at all. And they can be great leaders. Uh, Bernie Sanders is uh, an older member of the Senate. He's also one of the more exciting members. And, to a lot and so of is Ed Markey. I was trying to get it. Like yeah. Ed Markey is like super compelling and exciting, but like from a, in a completely different way that I made like the the comparison between him and Michelle Wu so interesting to me. You could like yeah. see different characteristics. I think the point the problem is the fact that so many of the people in leadership are so old is a sim- it is a symptom of a larger problem which is the failure to invest in young talent, the failure to build up new members of the party and give them powerful positions. And then when you see someone like Brian Schatz go to the floor and deliver a kind of 
withering indictment of Josh Hawley and is kind of live and on his feet and keeps up and is like sophisticated and thinking in a forward looking way about how we should be messaging and how we should be fighting these fights. And then you look at the chairs of these committees, uh, you know, kind of looking around through gray, watery eyes, trying to figure out what to do to respond to Ted Cruz. Right. Uh, it's um, I believe it's a struggle. I believe Republicans tried to uh, put term limits on their committee chairs. Yeah. Yeah. No. But the like, right, the AOC gets to Congress and is doing Instagram lives, and it's like a revelation for all of Washington D.C. But she's just sort of like communicating like someone in that age range would do on a normal day. Yeah. I mean, I think just native to her. I think there's two issues here. One is sort of. The younger members of Congress, I think the class of 2018, there were a lot of young members elected, especially on the Democratic side, whether they were progressive or uh, more moderate, and sort of boxing them out from leadership has become a, a bit of an issue. And then there's just like the average age of Congress as a whole is is older, and that just means we need more young people to run. Uh, for office. Yeah, and there's that's, never just, been... that's something that everyone can fix by just going to run for office and supporting young candidates for office. Yeah, absolutely. And run for something is, is doing that and organizations like that. And um, so that's that's something to keep in mind. All right. Finally, someone asks, what's the most awkward thing Lovett said or did in front of Barack Obama? I was trying to think of what this might be. Me too. I mean, I think of one embarrassing one, which... It was when he was on we're on some sort of trip and he was going to that fun, he was going to a fundraiser and it was a fundraiser after the play sister act mm-hmm. and he had done a you know a bunch of policy speeches but then he was landing in in, in in New York and going to this fundraiser uh, and he came up to me and said like hey I'm, I have to go do this thing where this is a weird thing I gotta go up after this play has happened is there some kind of joke you can give me he's not doing he wasn't doing a formal speech or anything but hey do you have a joke and I just, it was so stupid what I said. <clears throat> what was it? So what I said, I had a very stupid joke. And so what I said was, uh, I hope you enjoyed, and it's bad. He said, I hope you, en- I, I said, maybe you should say something like, I hope you enjoyed Sister Act. Now, <laughs> say it, you let us. Here's, here's my brother act. <laughs> it was horrible. It was a horrible thing. I was, was on the spot. It was poorly. <laughs> And he just looked at me and he went, no. <laughs> and then and then he like looked at his watch. Oh, he looked at his watch and he's like, he said something like, I, I'm going to be busy for like an hour. See if you can beat that. And this is kind of like, see I if, guess, see if you can come up with something else. Like yeah, kind of like. This is my funny guy? Like this is, that was appalling. And so then I just like paced around for like an hour, freaking out. I have one more chance. I can't even give. I was like, do I give him three? I just give him one joke. Okay. I wasn't even writing anything down. I just mm-hmm. like had to like say. I had to come up with one good joke for him to use. And the joke, I was like, I need something that I know is gonna work. And I was like, okay, wait. Uh, sister at convent. He likes jokes about his daughters. Or I have something. And so the joke I gave him, which which he appreciated and fixed my terrible blunder, was, it is so great to be here with all of you. Uh, 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 not only do you get to see a wonderful play license, like Sister Act, but I'm doing research on the convent to send Malia after she graduates high school. I remember that joke. And it was like he, he gave me a fist bump. It repaired uh, it repaired the damage that I had done with truly one of the dumbest things I've ever said out loud. I have, I'm like sweating now thinking about it, not like jokey, like in a kind of like I am, in, I am embarrassed to Gla- this day. No, and I'm glad you could advance that sort of like a patriarchal kind of condescending It is a toxic, the, is there toxic masculinity in the joke? 100%. Mm-hmm. But I just needed to survive the day. Okay? Yeah, yeah no. And sometimes, you, and sometimes in a toxic masculine environment that is America, Next time. You do what you do to, do next to do Next time, Lovett will tell you the story about how he pissed off Buzz Aldrin. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <you> tell that <laughs> one. No, no. I just, another day. Another day. <laughs> Tune in next time. Fuck. I thought Pod you, Save America. You heard it here second. <laughs> I thought that you were going to tell the story about the time you, you broke wind in the cabinet room. I, I, I've farted in a lot of places, but I've never farted in the cabinet room. No, and um, who was there? Ray LaHood was there? <laughs> Ray LaHood. <laughs> He blamed it on Ray LaHood. I did. I was that like, was the problem. Ray LaHood, what'd you have for lunch, Ray LaHood? <laughs> you quaint relic of an era where we put one Republican like you on this thing. When we come back, Tommy's interview with Elizabeth Warren. Poor Elizabeth Warren has to follow this. Yeah, she's been sitting here the whole time waiting for her turn. <laughs> <laughs>
The presenting sponsor of this episode of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. When Simply Safe Home Security's founders, Chad and Eleanor Lauren, wow, look who's oh, back, guys. Back. Chad and Eleanor they're Lauren back, Chad. designed their first security system in their kitchen. They did it for a very personal reason. Their friends had just had their home broken into. By Chad, Chad and Eleanor <laughs> yeah. Lauren. You know, you know who doesn't get broken into? Chad. Chad's generally. Yeah. Chad, yeah. Like the meme Chad. Mm-hmm. They were struggling to find a security system that was simple to set up and would make them feel safe again. Making people feel safe is what Simply Safe has been doing ever since that moment 15 years ago. Simply Safe has highly trained security experts ready when you need them, whether that's during a fire or burglary, a medical emergency, or even just when you're setting up the system. There's always someone there who has, has your back to keep you safe and make sure you feel safe. Love it. You didn't need to call anyone while you were setting up your Simply no. Safe uh, security system. You did it yourself. I did it my, my, all by my lonesome. Good for Worked you. Worked really well. I set it up myself. Took a few minutes, really. A few minutes. A few Less minutes. than an hour. And once it was set up, it's been working seamlessly ever since. Huge fan. Look at that. Claim a free indoor security camera plus save 20% on your Simply Safe security system and get your first month free with the interactive monitoring service. Visit simplysafe.com slash crooked to customize your system and start protecting your home and family today. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Real Paper. It's time that we stop flushing our forests. It's estimated that Americans flush over 10 million trees worth of toilet paper every year. That's actually, it is nuts. nuts. I don't think our I don't think our, our future people will be very pleased with us. No. no. What Gross. were you doing? You were turning that into that? What <laughs> monsters? And if you're using the conventional TP that comes wrapped in single-use plastic, odds are you're using tissue that's cutting down trees from North American old growth. Forest. I hate that. Yeah, it's it's very nationalist right there. Um, Real Paper is looking to change that and is available online on Amazon and now in most targets nationwide. Real Paper uses fast-growing bamboo in their paper products instead of virgin tree fibers from our forests. Similar to the grass in your lawn, bamboo regenerates from the same root so they can harvest the same plant. This helps avoid problems like soil erosion, habitat loss, and most importantly, the massive release of stored carbon. Best of all, Real Paper is an easy swap. Personal experience, the best part of the sad. Tommy? Tommy, <laughs> they're uh, what do you think? They're wiping up the competition, John. Hey, <laughs> there Thanks. it is. There it is. Too soft, too strong. How does it look in your bathroom? All just right. Like toilet paper. Real is now available in most Target stores nationwide. Target.com and on the Target app. Hey, they got the Target. Good for you, Real. Tar- it's a big get. That must have been a big deal that Almost day at the as office. Big as Pod Save America. <laughs> that must have been a huge day, right? <laughs> when they got Target. <laughs> we, got we got Target. Target. Yeah, we got Target. That's cool. Target carries our convenient 12 pack box that's the perfect size to try out your new favorite tree free paper. If you're looking for a reel and a target, it should be easy to spot. They'll be the only bamboo toilet paper and the only option that you'll find in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. So let's stop flushing our forests and give reels tree-free paper a try. Zero trees, zero plastic, zero compromises with reel. I love reel. Pod Save America is brought to you by Priceline. Most of us are getting ready to travel again. Uh, we are currently on the we're road as DC. we speak. Yeah. As we speak. And we're going to need more to make up for all we missed. With Priceline, you can save up to 60% on your favorite hotels and... You can also get exclusive deals on car rentals, flights, and more. And when you save more, you can do more. Host insert their own travel experiences here. Crooked Tour, for example. Don't mind if I do. Mm-hmm. I had a great travel experience, thanks to Priceline. Yeah, they yeah. save you money. They find you good flights. Makes it easy. Didn't Shatner used to do Priceline? I think I was, so. I was going to cool. say my travels have been easy, but like knock on wood. You yeah, know, we're yeah, only yeah getting right ahead of us here. You can rent a car on them sometimes, yeah, I think. Yeah. I don't know. You can do it all on Priceline. You can do it all. You can do it all. Priceline knows that every trip is a big deal. So when you're ready to book your next one, check out Priceline.com for the easiest way to get more out of your next trip. Pod Save America is brought to you by AG1. What if I told you you could get 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods sourced in superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens in a single scoop of mythical green powder? Very exciting stuff. I appreciate you telling me. Fantasy can become reality with AG1. Uh, Tommy, you know, you've been on it for... I like how they say I've been on it. Yes, I've been been on the sauce for years now. (laughs) I love it. Doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It's not wheatgrass, John. No, they, they got something against wheatgrass here at AG One. Harsh, um, but it's great. It's not. It doesn't make you jittery. Nope. You don't seem jittery to me. Uh, not yet. Yeah, no. It's you, if you don't want that jitteriness of coffee, you could take some AG One. Get the mental clarity, the alertness. That's what you need. Recommended by professional athletes and with over 7,000 five-star reviews, this is high nutritional value in its most convenient format. Health potions and power-ups don't exist in real life, but AG1 feels as close as you can get. AG1 is completely adaptable to your particular lifestyle, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. What if you do all of them? Like me. It's a lot of free. Yeah, that's you. That's you. Just cabbage and... Just, uh, uh, yeah, you're just... I don't just, even just know cabbage what's cabbage and AG1 at this point. point. Yeah. Bamboo. Yeah. <laughs> to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and 
five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash cricket. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash cricket to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Uh, I am thrilled to welcome into the Los Angeles studio, Senator from Massachusetts, my home state, the Commonwealth. I'm not going to get this wrong this time, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Oh, and I am thrilled to be here with you is wonderful. in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's nice. Is it? It's probably a little nicer here than Boston right now. Uh, we never use words like nicer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a little sunnier here sunnier. right now and a little warmer. Warmer. But remember, there are always those Yankees who love it gloomy and cold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For me, it's like I call my mom. I'm like, how is the weather, mom? She's like, well, you know, we haven't been able to walk the dog yet because the snow's still eight inches high in May or whatever, but... Yeah. You know, so that's interesting persists. that your mom's version is we haven't been able to walk the dog. My husband, you know, who's born and raised in Massachusetts, his view is you can walk the dog 365 days uh-huh. a year, any one of the 24 hours in that day. It makes absolutely no difference what the weather is doing. You just have to, this is always his, dress appropriately. Okay. So I now have the weirdest assortment of boots and and rain gear and yep. winter gear the jacket and long that makes you underwear. Yes, yes, the jacket yep, yep. that makes me look like the Michelin tire boy. <laughs> and it turns out Bailey totally agrees with him. Yeah. All weather is golden retriever weather that is, in Massachusetts. Bailey is correct. Yes. Per usual. Um, totally. Well it's wonderful to have you. Good to uh, be here. It's good to chat about fun stuff. Um jump into the questions here because sure. I'm a Democrat. I'm a, I'm a I've heard that. constitutionally nervous person. Mm-hmm. There is some polling that suggests some headwinds for Democrats going into the midterms, to put it mildly. Um, there was a poll out yesterday, April 12th. We're, we're recording this on April 13th. Out of Nevada, for example, that showed President Biden at like a 35% approval rating. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto, the governor, both underwater there. So, you know, Mitch McConnell is out there salivating, you know, the, the vampire can predict a bloodbath. He says it's the worst political environment for Democrats since 94. What do you think we do to right the ship between now and November? I think we need to get stuff done. I, and that's the G-rated version of it. Sure. Uh, we really need to finish delivering on some big deal promises we made during the 2020 election And on the ones we can't deliver on because we don't have 50 votes, then we need to be shown swinging the bat as hard as we can. Um, Look, Mitch McConnell and the rest of the Senate and House Republicans want to keep the whole conversation as we roll into 2022 about uh, the militant left and... uh, 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 their version of whatever they think mm-hmm. they can raise hell about right. this year. Whatever culture war. Exactly. Because remember, they do not want to talk about what actually needs to be done in this country because Mitch McConnell's plan is to do nothing. He said this quite openly. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't have to make this up. He brags about it, yeah. Yeah, he brags about it. He says, put the, Democrat, put the Republicans in charge and we will make sure nothing happens. And That goes to the heart of what his whole party is about. This is a party that has exactly two ideas. Whatever goes wrong, they have two ideas. One is to cut taxes, and the other is to put a bunch of extremists on the Supreme Court and uh, lower courts Mm -hmm. who will impose their extremist ideas, their extremist religious ideas on the rest of America. And so the worst that could happen from Mitch McConnell's point of view is if we're actually talking about the things we've gotten done and the additional things we are going to do if you give us a couple of more Democrats in the Senate and hang on to the House. Totally agree with you there. The the other sort of challenge looming in the background is inflation hit 8.5% in March. There's a bunch of reasons why that we can get into. I'm sure we actually listeners would love to hear your sort of thoughts on why. I've heard you talk about and other Democrats talk about how corporate greed and, and mm-hmm. record profits for corporations is leading to inflation. The White House is calling it Putin's price hike because we're seeing energy prices go up because of the war. I think both of those points are helpful. Those are good explanations that can help me understand why all of a sudden you know commodities are so expensive. But I, I'm worried that those explanations are less helpful when it comes to winning a political argument that Republicans will make that is going to be basically Democrats are in charge. Everything's more expensive. If you're pissed about how much it costs to fill up your truck, 
vote Democrats out, and vote for us Republicans. How, how do you think we take on that political fight? So I, we do it two ways. One is let's talk about the rest of the economic news as well. A mm -hmm. little over a year ago, uh, the uh, economists, pundits were saying it would take about, most were saying around four years for us to get unemployment back to where it was before the pandemic started. Same thing on GDP growth. Uh, GDP growth is zooming ahead. And as you know, unemployment rates are at historic lows. The president's administration has created more than 7 million new jobs. That is the most new jobs created in any administration in the first 14 months in our entire history. We need to be talking about that. Were you surprised by that number, that success? Well, actually, you know, the pieces fit together. I'm yeah. not at all surprised. Yeah. We got out there just about a year ago right now and passed what was called the American Rescue Package. Mm -hmm. And you may remember, it was a lot of money, but it was money that went into vaccines uh, right. and uh, and the the kind of the community health center way of getting the di distribution out. It was money that went into getting our schools open again and making sure they would have the resources to do that. And it was money that went into small businesses to keep those little businesses open and to keep jobs open. Mm -hmm. And it worked. People have jobs. And that seven million figure, that's not just an abstraction. Those are 7 million people who went home on payday and had enough money to buy groceries, who were able to make rent, whose kids stayed in school, people who didn't have to move, people mm -hmm. who didn't get foreclosed against. Right. And yes, putting that money in at the same time that you then turned around and hit shifts in demand because of the pandemic, supply chain kinks because of the pandemic, um, Putin... Uh, 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 both driving up the cost of oil and the cost of wheat and yeah. uh, soy and other things that are produced in Ukraine. But the other one is watching the giant corporations, particularly where there's a lot of concentration. Mm -hmm. These giant corporations said, hmm, everyone's talking about price increases. This, they saw it, was their chance to pass along costs. Okay, that much I get. But to take another dollop on the price scale and just boost their profits. So we've got all these companies that are at record profits. And because of increased concentration, there's no way to compete those prices back down. Right, right. So you've got these multiple threads running through here. So my view on this, first, is it's not going to look like this in another five months. It will be different. Now, Will it be enough? Will inflation be down? I can't make that prediction. Sure, sure. But we do know supply chain kinks are working their way out. We don't know what will happen with the pandemic. Uh, we do know people have their jobs. But what we need to be doing is we need to be talking about the good economic news that is in part tied to the challenges of inflation and we need to be talking about the causes of this inflation. And I want to say here, talk about, talk about. It's not just talk about. Let's give a little credit. The president of the United States, let, focus in, for example, on price gouging. Mm -hmm. He's put the dream team in the field. Uh, Lena Khan yeah. at the FTC. Go get them, right. Lena yeah. Khan. And uh, uh, Jonathan Cantor over at the Department of Justice. Uh, fabulous. The president himself has put out an executive order requiring every agency around government to look at concentration, price gouging, competition, encouraging competition. And that's true at the Department of Agriculture. It's true over at uh, the defense contractors that there's a big push throughout uh, government. And the importance of that is to recognize it's been 40 years since there's been any real push mm -hmm. to enforce antitrust laws and to remind ourselves that all these folks who purport to love a market economy don't actually seem to want to see a competitive market. You right. know, fine for other people, but not for them. And the role of government is to, to keep those markets more competitive. And the president's team 
is already beginning to deliver on that. And they got a lot more in the pipeline. That's good. That's good news. Um, one interesting piece of this economic puzzle that's hopeful, and we, we actually put out a, a request for questions from our audience. We got a bunch of different versions of this one, which is, you know, the past month we've seen some pretty amazing success for organized labor in America. Yeah. Um, the, I was just going to go there. Good. Like, is this so fabulous? You it's, can't it, believe it. So 7 million new jobs. I put it in the personal immediately. People right. who could go home at night and know they still had a job the next morning. But the rest of it is enough worker power for the first time again in like two generations right. where the baristas at Starbucks are <laughs> making it happen. The people packing at Amazon are making it happen. Right. 16 locations in Starbucks locations so far. Yep. Uh, the the uh, Two of them in the Boston area. There we go. Mm -hmm. The ALU organized a warehouse in Staten yep. Island. So that's those are big wins. What can the government, the Congress, the administration do to put some wind in their sails and, and help those efforts? Well, partly we need to be cheering them on, right. which I'm certainly doing. But sure, sure. partly it helps enormously to have Democrats over at the Department of Labor and have uh, an NLRB, have a Department of Labor that's willing to enforce the labor laws. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I think it's very <laughs> helpful because it, it, if you're not in the middle of these, it's easy to miss how much... When these employers come in with all their muscle, think about what it's like to try to organize a place like Amazon or a Howard place Schultz like was calling and labor leaders saying, you don't want to do this. You don't want to Th do this. This is back in the day. Yeah, exactly. But. No, but it's true. It's true. Same kind of thing at Amazon. They call all the workers in and, you know, in effect have these uh, uh, these sessions where they tell them how terrible it's going to be if the union takes over. They've got all these union busting law firms mm -hmm. and PR firms that – this is how they get paid. They figured out which buttons to push to terrify workers yeah. if they decide to vote for a union. And frankly, many times, it appears, they break the law. Well, we now have uh, an NLRB. We now have a secretary of labor willing to enforce the laws. Wow. Hmm. So there's more that needs to be done. There's a PRO Act pending that would make it easier for workers to unionize. I'm all for that. I I will push it. I will push it. I will push it. We need to get it through the Senate. But just using the tools we've got available, um, letting workers say to each other, you know, I think we can do this, and then having the government to say to the Starbucks of the world, hey, back off and let them decide what they want to do. Right. No intimidation. That's terrific. Yeah. Maybe we could unionize um – Jeff Bezos's little uh, Starship flight there we crew. Go. <laughs> I love it. Just I love a thought. It. <laughs> um, this is a long question because it's a hobby horse of mine, so just bear with me. Uh, listeners might have heard of a person named Jared Kushner. There's a long report about him in the New York Times this week. The context for everyone to know is, you know, Jared Kushner married Ivanka Trump. His father-in-law uh, becomes president. He appoints himself the shadow secretary of state with no experience. He becomes the de facto point guy for the U.S.-Saudi relationship. He did a lot of favors for the now Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Most infamously, Jared reportedly helped cover up MBS's role in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who is uh, a Washington Post journalist who just brutally executed. So the, in the Times earlier this week, we learned that Jared received a $2 billion, billion with a B, uh, investment, in air quotes, from a Saudi investment fund despite serious concerns from the fund's professional oversight board. Some of those concerns were uh, Jared's company's inexperience. Their operations were a mess. The <laughs> fees were too high. This is my favorite. Jared created a public relations risk for them, the Saudi government, who brutally executes journalists. Um, live with that one, Jared. So MBS overruled these objections. He cuts Jared a $2 billion check. In my mind, I read this story, and I think, using your White House job, to help a foreign dictator evade responsibility for a murder and then getting a $2 billion kickback is one of the most staggeringly corrupt things I've ever mm -hmm. heard. It, is there a role for DOJ or Congress or any entity to, to look into this, to scrub this? So the answer is yes. Um, actually, can we put one more little piece in? Please. You, you left the little, you know, the little piece of parsley that you put on the side of the plate uh, when you're serving sure. this up. Um, as I understand it, uh, there was also a, 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 a requirement that, yes, Jared would now be the manager of this fund, 
But he actually had to hire real people who knew what yes. they were doing to yes. run it. He yes. will just get a management fee. But on the what appeared to be the promise that he will never actually do any work, that's that's Great. part of the agreement. Sweet I just, gig. It's, it is kind of a sweet gig there. Uh, insulting, but but sweet. <laughs> yes. um, so, or just uh, revelatory, yes. uh, maybe is the right word. So, look, I think there's a question that the Department of Justice should take a really hard look to see if that fits within any of our current... I mean, it is a kind of shaggy dog version of how you get to what's going on here. Does it violate any of our criminal laws? And I'd want to take a hard look at that. But there's a second thing that maybe I just always go back to what's the tool in front of me since Mm -hmm. I'm not over at DOJ. I'm in the Congress. And I think this is a moment when Congress needs to do a lot more about corruption. Amen. And I mean, we have to do on I, corruption. And you've been good inside the House, yep. outside the House. Yep. You've been calling for a lot of reforms. Yep. I'm hoping you can elaborate on Absolutely. So let's just start with one across the board. It wouldn't apply to Jared, but it's it tells you about where we are if we can't do this. So... I have a bipartisan, did you hear me say that? Mm -hmm. Bipartisan bill uh, with Senator Daines. And the two of us have a bill that say, if you're a member of Congress, you cannot buy stock, you cannot sell individual stock, you cannot own individual stock, and neither can your spouse. And that's just the deal. If you want to be in the stock market... You can be in uh, mutual funds, in index funds, but that's it. This is public service. You can buy all of the stocks if you want. You Mm -hmm. can buy an S&P index fund. You can buy an all Dow Jones index fund. Have at it. You just can't buy individual companies that you might regulate. That's exactly right. You just can't do that anymore. What's the argument against that? Uh, Well, there are some people who say... Uh, but I like trading in individual stocks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and sure. I I get that. I try. Actually, I don't try to be respectful. I'm trying to think. I try to keep a straight face. Uh, but the bottom line is we got to do this. And, and I use this as an example of we need to start sweeping out the stables mm-hmm. around Congress. And let me be blunt. That should be the law for Congress. It should also be the law for every federal judge. Yeah. It should also be the law for every member, uh, the governors of the Federal Reserve. Yep. And obviously should be the rule for everybody who heads up a cabinet agency or uh, 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 of any of our independent agencies in government. This is just how it should be. And I think of this as this is step one. This is clean up the filth on the floor 101 and we get this done and then we move on to other questions involving conflict of interest involving taking care of yourself instead of the people who elected you to be here uh, I'm, listen I, I have so much respect for speaker pelosi and a lot of members of the democratic party but this is one where i think some folks are just on the wrong side of the issue pod save america is brought to you by utter known we love Outer Known here at Crooked Media, and not just for their clothing, but also what they stand for. Outer Known is offering men's and women's clothing where style meets sustainability. Their mission is to provide great clothes that don't harm the environment. Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. 95% of products are made from organic or recycled materials. Their clothes are high quality, they're sustainable, they're comfortable, they fit great. It's timeless style that's made to last for multiple years. I'm sitting right next to a man who just rocks out in Outer Known clothing all the time. So true story. Um, I thought about bringing an outer known sweatshirt for this show that we're about to do in two hours. I instead brought a short sleeve shirt because I thought I might be warm on stage. It turns out it's chilly in here. I'm really wishing missing your outer known. I brought my outer known. So, you know, the lesson here I think is always bring your outer known and always wear your outer known. And maybe have a couple different outer known styles. So yeah. for different weather patterns. Right. <laughs> sure. You know, and just be like Kelly Slater. That's right. A pro surfer and 11-time world champion, Kelly Slater, who was the founder of I Don't Know. Just have to put that in That's here. That's cool. Uh, best-selling items. you got the blanket shirt. Super cozy. Just as cozy as it sounds. Feels like a blanket. Everyone loves it. Jumpsuits. Easy to get dressed in. Flattering. Fit perfectly. Uh, range of style. 
Go to OuterKnown.com today and enter the code CROOKED at checkout, and you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's OuterKnown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. And remember to use the code CROOKED at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today, OuterKnown.com, and don't forget promo code CROOKED for 25% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by Little Spoon. Little Spoon is a one-stop shop for healthy, easy mealtime and snack time for your baby, toddler, and big kid delivered right to your door. Most of the kids' food at the grocery store is heavily processed and often on the shelf longer than your little one has been in this world. Simply put, your baby food should not be older than your baby. I think that seems fair. Yeah, that's fair. Rule of thumb. Little Spoon makes everything fresh and uses absolutely nothing artificial. It's just like homemade, all delivered to your door and ready in seconds. Pop your meals in the fridge or freezer and use them when you're ready. It's that easy. Little Spoon makes 100% organic, cold-pressed baby food for every eating stage, has a toddler plus kids food line that takes you through the weaning stage and into the big kid years, and launched a line of on-the-go smoothies. Tommy, Big Spoon Vitor. (laughs) All of their recipes (laughs) taste absolutely delicious, are nutritionally balanced, and free of junk, helping to set your little one up for a lifetime of health. Seriously, I tried everything, and all this little kid's food tastes legit great. Charlie's even eating even better than me. Uh, the, the food goes from stage one smooth single ingredients through to complex textured blends as your little one ages. A lot of detail here. A lot of detail. The toddler and kids' food plates has kids' classics like mac and cheese, but with hidden butternut squash and carrots, as well as more adventurous meals like cheesy pupusas or chicken pot stickers, stuff you would never make at home that your kid will love and that are packed with nutrients. The best part? The price is right. Come on down, John. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. With kids meals under $5 and baby food and smoothie snacks under $3, it makes trying Little Spoon easy. Start the new year fresh with Little Spoon. Get 50% off your first order with the code CROOKED at checkout. Pod Save America is brought to you by Framebridge. Framebridge makes it easier and more affordable than ever to frame your favorite things without ever leaving the house. From art prints and diplomas to the photos sitting on your phone, you can Framebridge just about anything. With Mother's Day around the corner, Framebridge also makes the perfect gift. In fact, select gifts ship the next day. Here's a reminder of how it works. You just go to framebridge.com and you upload your photo, or they'll send you packaging to safely mail in your physical pieces, if you still like doing that kind of thing. Preview your item online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts. Choose your favorite or get free recommendations from their talented designers. No physical pieces in the metaverse. (laughs) The experts at Framebridge will custom frame your item and deliver your finished piece directly. It's a high commission. (laughs) <laughs> directly to your door, ready to hang. Instead of the hundreds you'd pay at a framing store, their prices start at $39 and all shipping is free. Plus, our listeners will get 15% off their first order at framebridge.com when they use our code CROOKED. Order online at framebridge.com or stop by a Framebridge store to work with a designer in person if you're in New York, D.C., Atlanta, Philly, Boston, or Chicago. No pathos in this read. <laughs> Personal experience. Love Framebridge. Uh, we had a Framebridge emergency the other day. Oh, Wow. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I know. Remember, we have, we have our gallery wall that Emily oh my did. God. I, know. Yeah, I know. Well, get ready. It's on Instagram. Well, it's, well of course. And uh, and uh, we wallpapered that wall, so mm-hmm. we had to take it all down. And then suddenly Emily was like, how do I put all the pictures back up again? Framebridge sent the uh, sent the map again. They had it all saved. They sent it back. We put up the pictures. Wow. Crisis what a, averted. What a relief What a story. What a story. You, were, you were in the edge of your seat, weren't you? I bet you were. <laughs> Moms are jugg- always juggling work, home, schooling, etc. They deserve to be acknowledged for all of their constant love and hard work. We love moms. It's a controversial statement here. We love sure. moms. Yeah. Is there a mom in your life that you'd want to recognize and send a Framebridge gift to? Uh, yeah. There Tons is of moms. Don't tell, don't, you don't have to say who it is. I don't want to. It's a lot of moms. Get started today. Frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift. Go to Framebridge.com and use promo code CROOKED to save an additional 15% off your first order. Just go to Framebridge.com, promo code CROOKED. Framebridge.com, promo code CROOKED. Um... Speaking of the stock market, you know, it has been interesting for me to watch the sort of the emergence of apps like Robinhood and the kind of gamification of stock purchases, stock trading. There was the kind of fun moment of like AMC and GameStop and screwing over hedge funds and Wall Street. And like we could all cheer for that. But on every winning transaction on Wall Street, there's a losing transaction. And there's emerged this sort of like excuse my French, but shit posting culture, right? Where Elon Musk is tweeting uh, about Dogecoin to the moon or buying a huge stake in Twitter and failing to disclose it on time and sort of trolling his way onto the board. Uh, is is that a cultural problem? Is there a lack of regulation there? Like, how do you view this kind of new iteration of how stocks are being bought, sold, and traded by retail investors? So I think of this as 
markets are great, including entertaining. And I'm all for that. Have at it, baby. But <laughs> there's got to be a cop on the beat. Yeah. And the cop on the beat says there are certain things you can do. You can get out there and you can wag your fanny and do whatever you want. But there are certain other things you can't do. Pump and dumps are illegal. You've yeah. got to disclose uh, beneficial ownerships and, you know, so on and so forth. The rules are there. And frankly, for a long time, we haven't had much of a cop on the beat. The Donald Trump years is if there was a cop on the beat, I swear, the cop had a hood uh, uh, over uh, his head, you know, tightly wrapped, could not hear, could not yeah, see, not see could evil, not yeah. speak, yeah, yeah. saw no evil, right? Uh, but, the, uh, but the second half of this is the half in the crypto world where there's really no cop on any part of the beat because nobody can even figure out who's the right cop in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like your, your question about Kasagi, about where exactly is this wrong? And it's the reminder, you have to keep changing the laws as the world innovates mm -hmm. into new ways of cheating people. And if you think making money by cheating people is okay, then you're, you're in one part of the world. But if you actually think just some basic rules of the road, that uh, I, I'll give you an example. You put money in to uh, 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 one of, on one of the crypto exchanges, and you want to be able to get it out. You put in a hundred bucks. How much is it going to cost you to get it out? The fees are massive. It can cost you forty bucks to get your money back yeah. out, and that's not always made clear. No. Right up front, or. You want to be able to get your money out, and it turns out you want to get yours out because there's a run. A lot of other people are trying to get theirs out. That the exchange can decide to privilege its insiders, its buddies, the people who own the exchange, and you can get yours out in about 28 more hours, hmm. after which, of course, the price has gone right. to nothing. And I, my, my point around all this is there need to be basic rules. When people think that they're entering markets, every market has got to have somebody there who says, hey, here are the posted rules, and here's the cop who's going to enforce those rules. And right now, we don't have that in crypto. And without that, it's a place that it works great for the insiders, right. and it can work great for a little while for some people. But it's also a terrible place for people to get fleeced. Yeah, and you have, you have trillions of dollars in value that have mm -hmm. been created out of literally nothing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and you have now an enormous industry built around cryptocurrencies and incredibly rich people and corporations who are now seeking to write these laws, both in a federal level, on the state level, does that concern you? I mean, I, I look around at, you know, sort of basic taxation laws and you look at the fact that South Dakota has now become maybe the world's premier tax shelter. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to make fun of the Cayman Islands or Swiss banks. It's now it's South Dakota. Mm -hmm. It's the best place to hide your money from law enforcement, taxes, uh, an ex-husband, you know, right. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Right. And, and, you know, the thing is, when when you 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 talk about creating something out of air. Remember where we were in the early 2000s? Mm -hmm. And so they kept pushing those subprime mortgages and everybody ends up with subprime mortgages. And then they came up with all those new instruments, the derivatives. And the idea was that somehow you took this big blob of hamburger and you just kind of kept patting it and reforming it and sold it as filet mignon. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you oh, remember yes. this? Yeah, yeah, the credit default yes. swaps. Steaks yeah. all the way down, you know, that it was so yeah. valuable. Everything's AAA rated. It was. It all became, you took a bunch yes. of trash and it all became AAA rated. And the, the, the thing always was, well, but this is new. This is exciting. You want to get in on it. And people would always glance in the rearview mirror and they'd say, Look how far we've come. Those derivatives were only worth a buck ninety-five yesterday, and today they're worth ninety-four hundred thousand million bazillion dollars. <laughs> right. Don't you want to be in on the ride? FOMO, yeah. Yeah, exactly. FOMA, FOMA, FOMA. And the problem was they didn't have 
enough to back them up. They had something, the, the homes the, ultimately, but they didn't have enough to back them up. On crypto, there ain't no there there. Yeah, there's there's not always an asset underlying. Not, not the always an asset. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, well, and sometimes the asset that sort of tokenizes is like oh, an well, NFT. the NFTs. Right. I get you on NFTs. I'm just talking about plain old yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. Uh, and and you know, even the ones that are stable coins, you know, the ones that say we are pegged one to one to the dollar. There's no cop actually checking. Is there a dollar to back this up? And when uh, some of these folks have been challenged on, so show us your paperwork to show us how this is mm-hmm. a one for one, they can't actually come up with documentation that shows they've got it. So I, it, it's a circumstance where it's got every flashing light that a lot of good and decent folks are going to lose everything. Yeah. And look, I, I, every time I talk about crypto on a show, I get yelled at from I know. people on Twitter with usually with laser eyes, which for God's sake, people just come on. But there are applications, I think, to cryptocurrency that are interesting. There's oh, ways yeah. you can code ownership into, you know, NFTs that's interesting, that helps artists, that helps musicians. I think the NFT, that. that's a different thing. Yeah. I think the NFT is, is interesting. I think blockchain is interesting. Right. But the idea that somehow they're building wealth through an alternative money system that has nothing that backs it up except we all believe right. it is valuable. I, it's a why, you know, tulip bulbs it's the tulip that. bulbs. That's yeah. what immediately comes to mind. As yeah. long as we all believe that it, it works. And the same kind of billionaire evangelists, yeah. whether it's Mark Andreessen or A16Z or Jack Dorsey or Peter Thiel, telling us, "Look, we know that you know Twitter, Facebook, all these things we created." turned out badly. But trust us again this time. This time it's going to work. Trust us with undoing (laughs) fiat currency. Right. Right. Seems like a bad idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was uplifting. Um, (laughs) Switching gears a little bit. So we're starting, you know, the the January 6th committee has been doing tons of work behind Mm -hmm. the scenes. We're starting to see bits and pieces of it Mm -hmm. in, in court cases, et cetera. You're also starting to hear some frustration from January 6th committee members and the Democrats generally. I mean, committee members are frustrated that DOJ has not enforced contempt citations when I witnesses know. don't cooperate. Some Democrats just feel like, hey, Merrick Garland, pick up the pace. You know, after the midterms, this committee might not exist and we need to get on, get, get a move on when it comes to prosecuting these ringleaders. Do you share those frustrations? I look at it this way. Um, Donald Trump thought that the Department of Justice worked for him. And that was a terrible, terrible moment Mm -hmm. in our history. The Department of Justice is headed by an attorney general who makes independent evaluations. And I think that's important. And I have a lot of respect for an attorney general like Merrick Garland, who says, I'm not here to be stampeded in a moment of politics. I make decisions based on what I believe the law to be, and I will follow through, whether it's popular or not. And he would say the same thing, that he's following in the tradition, think of it the other way around, of Robert Kennedy, who said, I'm going down to Alabama, and I'm going to help out people who've been barricaded in Montgomery. Uh, I'm going to offer protection, uh, even though it's going to be politically unpopular. There's Mm -hmm. There's an importance for insulating because the driving, driving truth of the Department of Justice has to be rule of law, and rule of law applied regardless of what your politics are. So I start by saying plenty of respect sure, on that. Sure. But I also want to say hubba bubba for what it is that the House has been up to in their January 6th commission. Um, can we just put in a short commercial, shame on the Republicans in the Senate who would not permit the inquiry into an armed insurrection mm-hmm. against the United States of America. Yeah. Uh, they voted against letting the Senate participate in that. I think that is just wrong and shows both how afraid they are of what would come out and how they are willing to follow Donald Trump like lemmings yeah. over the cliff. Um but having said that, 
House has gone forward and has uncovered. I mean, just to me, it feels like every day. So what is going to be today's revelation <laughs> about... Ginny Thomas's hobbies are whoa, very weird. Yes, we're learning a lot. Wow. And we always keep rethinking, like, hmm, how could it be that Clarence Thomas was voting yeah. on something that would affect whether or not the rest of us learned about what Jenny Thomas, potentially, learned about what Jenny Thomas was up to. Um, so I cheer on what the House has done. Uh, their committee is making all of this public. Hello, we're out here making this public. That's what they're doing. And I say good for them. And it's an act of self-discipline. But I hope, I trust, I believe that we have an attorney general who is looking at all of the evidence that gets produced from wherever it gets produced, and that he will make an independent decision based on rule of law that will follow through and hold people responsible for an armed insurrection against the United States of America. Yeah, I hope so, too. Please. We got, you know, today we're reading about Trump aides, some guy named Jason Sullivan telling a group of supporters that they need to go to D.C. to descend on the Capitol. You got Donald Trump Jr. forwarding along the plans for the insurrection before the votes had, you know, had been, election been called. You've got a, <laughs> exactly, they knew, right. They, they, you've got, what is it, a seven-hour gap in the president's yeah. uh, uh, phone logs, uh, just one piece after another. A lot of, lot of smoke there. A lot of smoke. Um, final question. Um, you just went through a, a Democratic primary process that, mm-hmm. you know, had Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. There's a bunch of conversations happening now about whether that process should be rethought, reconfigured, uh, and whether, in particular, Iowa and New Hampshire should go first, whether there should be any caucuses. I had the the great privilege of working in Iowa, um, spending a lot of time with your staff in Iowa. And, like, I am, you know, I have a lot of fondness for the kind of politics that came out of a caucus, the, the community meetings, the way people are forced to talk to their neighbors when you actually care about being someone's second choice, right? You're not just you know, beating them with a bat every day. You're trying to mm-hmm. convince people. Do you think it's time to reform this process? Or, and are there ways you think it could be better? I, I think it's time to reform the process. And I say that truly loving parts of what's there and hope that that we can genuinely hang on yeah, to that's them. how i feel too parts parts yes but, but parts is parts yeah. you know you yeah. you gotta hold on to the parts i love the fact think of it this way if the first primary were in california and i say this you know it's sunny out there it's beautiful i love you california right. but if the first primary were in california then the whole process would be almost exclusively about raising money and going on tv because you can't meet enough people in California. It's just too big an electorate, right? If we did a national primary, I know some people talk about national primaries, then it's all. It's who money. wins? It's going to be Michael Bloomberg, yeah, right? Because right. he's the only one who has the money from the first day. Unless you get to him first. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. But, <laughs> but so you've got to think about how do you get it down to a part where you can still some retail meet people, politics. some retail yeah, politics. Yeah. And I think retail politics are important because I think, at least for me, I learned a ton on retail politics. Now, on the other hand, look, the person in our party who lost Iowa pretty badly and lost New Hampshire pretty badly still got the nomination. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to think about how all those pieces fit together. And yes, it troubles me that you'll be three elections in before there's a significant participation by people of color. Yeah. Uh, and that's troubling. Yeah. So how to redivide that as Democrats? I don't know. I think it's hard. And I think, look, I think it's be blunt. One of the reasons it's hard is Iowa, this is a big deal for Iowa. Oh, yeah. It's, and it's they huge. make big money. Big money. Yeah. I, we were in motels that I used to think, I think I know why this motel is here. <laughs> right. <laughs> this what? motel is here because the caucuses And, and that's here. immediate impact. Well, you know, then you get to the ethanol industry oh, exactly. and farm subsidies. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think that's troubling. And, and the problem is 
the person who has the most power to change it, by definition, is the one who just won. Mm -hmm. So they never have any incentive. Oh, yeah. And most of the people who've really ground through the process, most, will never do it again. So it's kind of, okay, I'm past that and moved on. Yeah. But I think putting some real thoughtfulness into how we get representation and yet keep it as an on the ground dirt under the fingernails. I'd I'd be ready to I'd be ready to help in that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Um, I lied. Final, final question. Final final. So we here uh, at Crooked Media, we are trying to get people fired up for the midterms. All right. We are we have a midterm madness program. We're trying to break people up into regions, get them to volunteer. Super, super. We have lots of fun stuff. It's a little harder this time than it was in twenty eighteen. Yeah. You know, there's some people who feel like, uh, you know, Biden said he was going to uh, get rid of student debt. We haven't canceled it yet. Joe Manchin is really bumming me out. You guys have the trifecta. We can't get, get stuff done. What's your what's your elevator pitch to all the folks out there who might be on the fence about getting involved this time about why why they should? Roe versus Wade. The other side has been voting Supreme Court for 40 years now. Yeah. And the Supreme Court has got its toes on the line to end uh, women's access to abortion. We have Oklahoma and, just did. Uh, absolutely. And abortion. Uh, you know, can we pause for one second yeah. on that? You think about the fact that Oklahoma just passed a law to ban abortion effectively. It clearly violates Roe versus Wade. They couldn't wait three more months until the Supreme Court tosses Roe versus Wade into the trash bin, they are so confident. Yeah. They are so sure that they are right. They are. They want to be out ahead of this, and they're willing to thumb their noses at the United States Supreme Court current rule, knowing that this extremist Supreme Court will mm -hmm. back them up. Okay, so I just want to say to everybody who's listening, if you care, Roe versus Wade our only chance to protect a woman's right to an abortion is if we get two more senators in, on the Democratic side in the Senate and hang on to the House because we can create by statute. We don't have to rely on the Supreme Court. Roe versus Wade. Hmm. Second one is climate. The other side has made clear their view on climate is burn some more oil. Drill, yeah. baby, drill. Uh, if we're going to have any chance to save this planet, the, the Democrats are our best hope. This is what we've got. We've got the plans. We know all the directions to go in. We're ready to spend the money. We're ready to tax the billionaires to spend the money. Again, we need one or two more senators in, in the, uh, the Democratic side. Third one, student loans. Yeah. President can do it. And I am very, very hopeful that he will do it before the election and remind everybody in this country first that he fights for them. He fights for the 42 million Americans who are struggling with student loan payments. He fights for the 40 percent of them who don't have a college degree. He fights to help close the racial wealth gap. President canceling $50,000 of student loan debt is the single most effective thing he can do to close the black-white wealth gap among people with student loan debt by 27 points. Same thing for the Latino-white wealth gap. He wants to fight on the side of people who need his help, and he is willing to deliver. And if he does those things, then by damn, we need to show up and be ready to vote, to turn out that vote, to get everybody engaged, because it will be a reminder not only that the president cares, but that your vote matters. So three issues. There we go. We got to do them. You heard it here first, everyone. Uh, Senator Warren, thank you so much for coming in. It's great thank to see you. Me. Thanks for firing us up. And uh, <laughs> let's see do you soon. It. All right. Thank you to Elizabeth Warren uh, for joining the show. We'll uh, we'll talk to you on Thursday. We talked about this briefly during last week's live shows, but Vote Save America has launched our midterm madness competition. Came right after March Madness was over. Now we start <laughs> midterm madness. Um, if you go to votesaveamerica.com slash midterms, you can sign up to get connected with actions that you can take right now. Uh, we will host events mm -hmm. uh, where we lay out midterm strategy. We're going to help train you guys to become organizers. You can pick a region of the country to focus on, east, midwest, south, or west. 
uh, each of the Pod Save America hosts is uh, is coaching a region. I'm mm. a coach. I took Canada. I took the West. <laughs> Tommy took Canada. And the Midwest. <laughs> I took the West, Arizona, Nevada, some big races, a lot of competitive house races. I'm excited. I have the Northeast. And then Dan has the South, I believe. You bet he does. Okay. Well, we're trying to get at least uh, 10,000 signups per region, 40,000 total. At least. Love it. Wants to make sure that we emphasize that it's 40,000 like total. The he wants number. the big number. I like the bigger number. Uh, by the end of May. I tried to get him to do 50 at the live show. Just to kind of yeah, keep everybody on their toes. Painstaking <laughs> process to figure out how many signups. Yeah. Love it. Just wanted to add to it. Yeah. He's on doing his fly. Steve Jobs. What Absolutely. If, what if more? What if it was more? Yeah. Elizabeth Holmes over here. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're going to save this country with just one drop of blood. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been watching a lot of scamming. A lot of we crashed. Yeah. All right. So anyway, we need you to sign up by the end of May so we can be ready for November. So go sign up now. It's votesaveamerica.com slash midterms. You all did such a good job with Adopt a State for 2020. We want to basically recreate that again for the midterms. It's a, zone, it's a zone defense for democracy. There you go. How about that? Look at that. Yeah, that was that, on the fly. A, that works. That worked. Sure. Everyone knows it worked. Uh, also, check out this week's Offline. I had a great conversation with Lauren Williams. She's the former editor-in-chief at Vox, who left to start Capital B News, which is a new nonprofit news organization focused on fighting misinformation and distrust in the black community. Uh, we talked about how the George Floyd protests inspired a great reckoning in newsrooms, how the media has failed in their coverage of critical race theory, and why Capital B thinks that rejuvenating local news coverage is part of the solution to our online misinformation problem. Go check it out.